From his stronghold in the wild Sierra Maestre Mountains, Cuba's Fidel Castro emerged triumphant after two years of guerrilla warfare against the Batista regime. The revolution that began with Castro a fugitive, practically alone, landing with 82 followers to be nearly wiped out by government forces, ended with the flight of dictator Fulgencio Batista and the entry into Havana of rebel forces to be acclaimed by the city. In 1959, my father went to Cuba to make a movie about the revolution. Two years later, he showed up in Los Angeles, pounded on our door in the middle of the night, and claimed to have been imprisoned and tortured by the Cubans on a frog farm. That's what he said, a frog farm. My mother had him arrested, a psychiatrist diagnosed him as a paranoid schizophrenic, and until I was 41 years old, this was all I knew about my father's erratic behavior. Something happened to him in Cuba on a frog farm. In 1999, I went to Cuba to try and make sense out of the nonsense. Most of my life, I didn't even have a single picture of my father. After he died and I started wanting to know more about him, I got this picture. Not even a picture really, but a Xerox of a passport photo taken in 1961. My imagination played with that faded photocopy over the years, painting caricatures of this father I never knew as he was described to me by others who knew him. I met your father when I answered an ad in Daily Variety looking for a secretary and someone to do his television commercials. I'd been uh, modeling and going to the beach a lot and my mother thought it'd be a good idea for me to get a job and I agreed and that's how I met him. And I was attracted to him because he reminded me of a gangster. He sat there with those dark glasses on and a uh, very handsome man and a gentleman. Your father had been one of the pioneers in television production. During the day, he was the producer in a suit and a shirt and a tie. And at night, to earn money, he'd go out and fix refrigerators or something. And then he'd scrub his fingernails and become the producer during the day. And I admired him very much for that. In the late 1950s, my father acquired the rights to an early science fiction TV show called Space Patrol. He formed his own company, Comet Distributing Corporation, with the intent of syndicating Space Patrol to markets outside of Los Angeles. With Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol. He did fantastically with it. Somewhere along the line, he probably went to Florida, sold it there, and then somewhere along the line, he went to Havana. It was a momentous year for the new world, beginning with the rise to power of Fidel Castro in Cuba. My father arrived in Havana during one of modern history's defining moments. Fidel Castro was just days from entering the capital after his odds-bucking victory against the forces of dictator Fulgencio Batista. The atmosphere was electric. And Castro lashed out at critics. He met a lawyer named Fernando Penabaz. And Fernando, knowing that Mike had an interest in films, told him of his cousin, Manuel Penabaz, who was up in the Sierra Maestre with Fidel Castro and kept a diary, which Fernando said would make a terrific movie. This naturally intrigued your father, so a meeting was arranged with Manuel. My diary, I start my diary, since the first day that I arrived to the Sierra Maestra, my interviews with Castro and with a great deal of the, the fighters, the different subjects over there, very interesting people. By this time already, I have wrote from my diary, the red runs the sugar. And I was writing that book 
And at the same time, they were trying to convert the book in a, in a script in order to be able to produce the thing to a movie. We were having some marital problems. I may have wanted a divorce or something, and he said, why don't you come down here and bring the children and, you know, relax. You children were certainly enthused over the soldiers standing around with their guns everywhere you went. You thought that was pretty exciting. I got a telephone call from him one day. I knew he was in Havana, but he called me and he said, I want you to come down here immediately, as soon as possible. A Cuban corporation, Cubana Pictures International, had been set up with my father as president and Manuel Penabas as secretary. Financing was in place and publicist Bill Waters was generating a buzz in the Hollywood trade press. My father was able to get commitments from the likes of director Michael Gordon, noted for such films as Cyrano de Bergerac and Pillow Talk. There were even rumors of Frank Sinatra or Mel Ferrer being in the picture. Then a flattering article came out in Havana's Daily, El Mundo, with the headline screaming, they're going to make a movie about the revolution. Raul Castro came to my house with the chief of the police, and Castro came and asked me, are you making a film about the revolution? Yeah, without our knowledge, we, we have to know who is these people, they are Yankees. And they're going to, to destroy the uh, image of the revolution. Raul Castro published a scathing article in the next day's edition of Revolución, the rebel newspaper, under a headline of a phony captain and a phony movie. The article not only discredited my father and his movie, but excoriated Manuel Penabas as a traitor and a profiteer. I talked to your father. I told him, listen, here's, here's what happened. These people are going to put me in jail. I went to the TV. I went to the TV and I exposed the situation to the public of Cuba. They saw in TV what I was saying and they get very upset. And the next day, I don't remember what time it was, but sometime during the day, the pounding on the door, really rather dramatic, really scary, a lot of noise and pounding on the door. And it was Raul Castro, I'm pretty sure it was Raul Castro, came to the door and pounded on the door, demanded to be let in, and it was really a little frightening. And uh, I remember we all jumped under the beds and hid in the closets, and he was looking for a pen of beds. I went directly to the Mexican embassy without going to my house and without telling my wife and anybody that I was going to the Mexican embassy. If I stay in Cuba, I, I will be dead by this time. No, no doubt about it. In early March of 1959, my father's ambitious Cuban film enterprise came to a screeching halt. Manuel Penabas had fled the country. My father and several associates were detained in their hotel for about a week, then released. All but my father left Cuba immediately. Nobody knows for sure what happened to my father in the days after the film project ended, but something clearly happened. We got out, and I think he was not allowed to get out. I'm almost sure he, he did not stay voluntarily. The cry in Havana is Cuba, see, the Yankees, no. I suppose that Mike was communicating with me from Cuba because I went to look for him. I, I went to see him where he was living. And Mike didn't look well. He didn't look well. Just kind of run down. And he was telling me about some, some, uh, some things and I, it didn't quite, didn't quite make sense to me. It was shortly after Ibanez saw him in Havana that my father returned to Los Angeles and pounded on our door at 3 a.m. And he, he wasn't alone. Back, he brought Olga, who was a nice young Cuban lady, to help me take care of the children. I had a feeling he was, you know, sleeping with her. So I walked in on them and said, that's it, take Olga and take the airplane tickets and go back to Cuba. So he did. <laughs> In July of 1959, my mother filed for divorce after my father returned to Cuba with Olga, intending to marry her. And the next time we saw your father, 
He was not in good shape. He talked about the Cubans implanting listening devices in his brain. And he talked about working on a frog farm, which I found very amusing. I didn't know what he did. Maybe it was in public relations or something. I just can't picture him out there working with the frogs. Over the next several years, I saw my father so rarely, I generally forgot I had one. Then he just dropped out of sight until the late 1960s when, out of the blue, he called my mother and said he needed an affidavit from her. In 1967, my father had seen a notice in the post office about the Foreign Claims Settlement Program for Cuba coming to an end. He had rushed a hastily prepared claim off to the commission. I, Michael S. Colin, was jailed. My property confiscated, brutally beaten, electronically brainwashed in Principe Prison, interrogated by various Cuban army personnel, including Raul Castro, other officials of Cuban government, forced to work without pay for agricultural department headed by Pedro Moret under William Morgan, resulting in permanent brain damage. It seemed to me so fantastic, and, and there was no way that I could corroborate, follow up on anything that he said. What do you do with a claim like Who is responsible? The Cuban government? The American government? So I couldn't see what the target for a complaint of this kind would be. The claim was rejected by the Foreign Claims Settlement Commission for lack of evidence, over my father's objections that all the evidence he needed was in Cuba, out of his reach. He made a statement, and, and uh, I believed him, and, and uh, I, I wrote it down. There, there appeared to be some, uh, some uh, basis for the statements that he made to me. Otherwise, I, I, I don't think I would have done it, because I would be furthering his fantasies. And I didn't think they were fantasies. What can we say? We don't know. I tend to believe what I say. Everything is possible. Richard Ibanez and Manuel Penabaz may well have been the only people in my father's world who took at face value his claims about what happened to him in Cuba. But just about everyone agreed on one thing. He certainly was a, uh, absolutely a completely different man. Uh, the Mike Cole and I knew was a tough, really tough guy. So what happened? I looked at his claim again, hoping a clue, anything that made sense, would jump out at me. And I noticed something I'd skipped over before. William Morgan? An Anglo name, surrounded by Cuban names. Who is William Morgan? William Morgan was one of those Americans who, for the past hundred years, have floated down to Latin America and have gotten involved in Latin revolutions. In his case, it was Cuba, and it was the Castro Revolution. When I found this article on William Morgan, I felt like I was finally dipping below the surface of my father's story. As I read about Morgan, I also felt like I was stepping through the looking glass. He was a blonde, blue-eyed American who was born in Ohio, um, who was an ex-Marine. And um, he went down to Cuba, and some say he got involved because a friend of his got killed by the forces of the previous dictator. Whatever the reason was, he joined with the Castro forces and he rose to the highest ranks of the Castro government. After the rebels' victory, Castro promoted him to major, or commandante. The only American fighting with Castro to attain such a high rank, he was later stripped of his U.S. citizenship for fighting in a foreign army. Castro rewarded Morgan for his service by putting him in charge of one of the revolution's most innovative agricultural reforms, a frog farm on the outskirts of Havana. Suddenly, the most absurd element of my father's story had context. William Morgan and his frog farm were real, not just the rambling nonsense of a crazy man. Somehow or other, Morgan got put in charge of that particular frog farm. I'm not certain whether it was his idea or not. That frog farm, though, later turned out to be like a center for his counter-revolutionary activities, and that's where apparently, reportedly, he buried a lot of weapons that were to be used by anti-Castro anti forces later. Late in 1960, William Morgan was arrested by Castro on charges of being involved in a counter-revolutionary plot. On March 12, 1961, about a month before the Bay of Pigs debacle, he was executed for treason. 
This William Morgan was a pretty fascinating character, but I couldn't understand how my father went from his failed movie venture into Morgan's web of intrigue. In my father's claim against the Cuban government, he had stated that the FBI, CIA, State Department, and others knew all about his terrible experience in Cuba. Not wanting to leave any stone unturned, no matter how unlikely, I sent requests to these agencies, asking that any files of my father be released to me under the Freedom of Information Act. I also asked for files on William Morgan. I waited almost three years before I got any results. When I did finally get something, a response from the CIA about my father, it created more questions than it answered. They call this sanitizing. In its letter, the CIA said that they used to have a file on my father, but it had been destroyed. This was all they had left. Some months later, I got the FBI file on William Morgan. 380 pages of pretty amazing reading. And on one of those pages, after having spent so much time digging through papers trying to connect my father to whatever it is that happened to him in Cuba, it was overwhelming to see his name in William Morgan's file. There, in heavily sanitized black and white, my father was connected to William Morgan as his former publicity chief. Another document, a CIA brief on Morgan, listed my father as one of a handful of people in Morgan's inner circle. I was curious about the other names and, on a whim, did a search on the internet. When I searched for Jerry Hemming, I landed square in the middle of the John F. Kennedy assassination. William Morgan's FBI file was fast becoming an Oliver Stone movie. Jerry Hemming, Gerald Patrick Hemming, is a name well known to conspiracy theorists. Dig around in spook and conspiracy literature and you find Hemming's name popping up everywhere. Not only in files on the Kennedy assassination, but in many spooky activities sponsored directly or indirectly by the U.S. intelligence community. His description in Morgan's file painted a vivid picture. He claims to pilot a T-33 jet in Castro's Air Force. He's six foot four inches tall. He likes to wear military fatigues. What was my father doing with these people? Olga, the Cuban woman my father married in 1959, might well have an answer to that question. That is, if she's still alive, if she's still in Cuba, and if I can find her with the one piece of information I have to go on, a 40-year-old medical record of my father's listing Olga Calero Colon as his next of kin at this address, 509 Malacón 2C, Havana. I can't remember any other time in my life when I've literally flown off into such an absolute unknown. I look out the window at the dwindling lights of North America and feel I might hold my breath all the way to Havana. In 1959, a visitor to Havana wrote, To discover the truth of this capital, I would have to see things upside down. Entering Havana, I have a similar feeling. I've always imagined Cuba to be some dark and foreboding tropical gulag. I'm not prepared for the decayed beauty of the place. It's a city stuck in time. And my father's story is stuck with it. The Malacone is Havana's winding oceanfront boulevard. Built in 1900 by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the seawall fronting the Malacone has been battered ceaselessly for almost 100 years. As I stand there, a powerful surf slams against the seawall every few seconds, occasionally engulfing passing cars, pedestrians, or a horse-drawn cart. I can see, hear, feel, touch, and taste each wave. Somewhere up or down this weathered street, among the remnants of these many decaying buildings, is 509 Malacón, my only link to Olga. Hello. 
I meet a Canadian artist and his Cuban agent, whose name is Rolando. When I mention Olga's name, Rolando's eyes light up. He thinks Olga Calero might be related to Sonia Calero, a famous Cuban dancer now living in the States. He has a friend, a Santeria priest, very well connected, who might be able to help me. So after lunch, I'm taken to meet one Raul Chaveco. Olga Calero, yo creo que ella... Me parece que es hermana de Sonia. Raul makes me feel welcome from the word go. He has an engaging grin and an omnipresent cigar that seems as at home in his mouth as his teeth. But having a conversation in Spanish with him is a lot like watching a Shakespeare play for me. It takes me about 20 minutes to get into the rhythm of the language, and even then I have to strain to understand what he was saying because he speaks so fast. Es que la cara de su papá cuando la miro aquí de Olga Calero como era. No sabes el otro apellido de Olga. Raul and I spend the better part of an hour talking about my search for Olga Calero. He makes a couple of phone calls on my behalf, helps me look through the Havana telephone directory, and, by way of Chango, a major Santeria deity, informs me that I will most certainly find Olga, but my search is hobbled by a missing piece of critical information. I need to find Olga's second maternal name, the name by which many people are listed in directories and government files. So Raul agrees to accompany me to the office of Havana's civil registrar the next day to see if we can find a marriage record for her and my father. I try to see Havana through my father's eyes, try to get some sense of the Cuba he wrote about in his claim, the Cuba with teeth. I try to see danger, I try to feel threatened. It's a pointless exercise. I'm not my father, and I'm not doing whatever it was he was doing when he was here. The office of Havana's civil registrar is a dim, dank office crammed with massive piles of yellowing paper stored on overburdened shelves. As the clerk takes my information, I look around the office for a computer. Seeing nothing but ancient typewriters, I know with a dismal certainty that it will be weeks, maybe months, before I ever see a record, even if there is a record to be found. I'm wrong. So we came in here and saw the gentleman, and he took the information. We came back just a moment ago, and uh, he had success in finding the record. And this is what he gave me. It has the information typed on it. There's my father's name and Olga's name and the record number. So we're just waiting for them to actually get the uh, a facsimile of the document. <laughs> Muchas gracias. Look. I now have Olga's complete name, Olga Calero Mesa, but still face the considerable challenge of finding Olga herself. 1959. See? Si. Raul is ready to mobilize his sizable roster of friends and acquaintances, but I decide to try the path of least resistance first. We head for the Malacón. We slow as we approach the 500 block. The corner building, caught somewhere between the old and the older with a stunning facade of Moorish influence, is almost behind us when I spot the tiny 509 painted next to the entry.
Hola. ¿Es usted Olga Calero? Sí. Me llamo Michael Colwyn. It's that simple. The distance between myself and Olga, a distance spanning four decades, two estranged cultures, and thousands of miles, melts away in moments after we meet. Es increíble. No, es muy chiquito. Sí, sí. Muy chiquito. Sí, sí. Yo busco la historia de qué pasó con mi padre en Cuba. Hay unos documentos. I tell Olga about my father's difficult life after he returned from Cuba and that he died of a massive heart attack in 1974. She's quiet a moment, then tells me that he disappeared from her life abruptly and absolutely in late 1960 and that she never knew what had happened to him. No lo conoció bien. No, no, no conoció bien mi padre ni mi hermano. Olga suddenly says she has something for me and leaves the table, returning a moment later with a picture of my father. It's a shot taken in mid-1959 with her and her mother at the Hotel Capri, where Olga had been a dancer. It takes me a few seconds to recognize the man in the photo. In my entire memory of him, my father had been little more than an abstraction, those caricatures of his old passport photo. But here he is, whole, healthy, happy. Seeing that picture of him changed everything. In the blink of an eye, he became my father, I became his son, and I wanted more than anything to know what had happened to him. I never saw my father look this good. trabajaba de modelo en el Capri y, y él me vio y él me mandó una, unas flores al camerino y él iba todas las noches a verme todas las noches me mandaba flores él era muy agradable y a, a mí me gustó When I ask Olga to help me piece together the William Morgan puzzle, she suggests we take a drive. There are two important places she wants me to see. The first place is an apartment, and Olga has trouble remembering exactly where it is. This is where they lived before my father met William Morgan. The rent for this apartment was $35 a month, and money was always tight.
Ellos eh, entraban a una oficina, conversaban, hablaban, hablaban, en inglés siempre. Y yo mmm, conversaba con la esposa de William Morgan o, o a veces salíamos y, y ellos se quedaban siempre ahí. After my father started working with William Morgan, he and Olga moved into their second home, a $200 per month oceanfront villa with 14 rooms in Havana's swanky Miramar suburb. Unfortunately, the place had been torn down some years ago, so all she could show me were the ruins. Olga says that while they lived here, my father spent most of his days writing. He didn't have a job, but they always had plenty of money. My father never said where the money came from, and Olga didn't ask. Briefcases. Yo no sabía, ellos estaban hablando de negocio. El hombre se iba, le dejaba dinero. Tu papá eh, una vez me lo dijo. Tu papá me lo dijo. Pero yo no sabía que era eso. ¿Qué, ¿Lo dijo qué? A mí que era de la CIA. ¿De él? Tu papá, sí. Entonces yo le digo, ¿qué cosa es la CIA? Ahí don no En 1959, Olga had no idea what the CIA was, but she was surrounded by it. William Morgan's FBI file shows there were plenty of CIA assets hanging around the Yankee Commandante. There's substantial evidence that Morgan himself was CIA and had been so even before he set foot in Cuba. Jerry Hemming may have been a CIA asset, and June Cobb, who worked as Fidel's secretary and lived for a time in the Miramar house with my father and Olga, was definitely a CIA agent. No, Olga mentions no, no, no. another guest in the house. En otra oportunidad. Vino un muchacho joven que dice que era de Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Rubio, eh, es joven. El... Her description of the young man from Oklahoma rings so familiar. Then I remember something from my research, the Lacuba explosion. The French munition ship La Cubra blazes at dockside in Havana after an explosion during the unloading of her cargo of small arms ammunition that rocked the harbor. The blast hurled a fiery rain of steel over a wide area, taking a toll of lives that may mount to 100. Over 200 more were injured. A couple of days later, an article appeared in the Miami Herald with a headline reading, American Claims Dock Workers Set Ship Blast in Havana. The American was Jack Lee Evans, a young man from Oklahoma, who implied that William Morgan was behind the Lacuba sabotage. Evans said he learned of the plot while, quote, visiting an oceanfront home in Havana, close quote. A day after the explosion, a massive procession marched solemnly toward a memorial rally. Walking arm in arm with Fidel, Che Guevara, and others at the head of the column was William Morgan. I cannot wrap my mind around the notion that my father was somehow involved with the Lacuber sabotage. It just seemed impossible. But I can never know for sure, because even though Fidel Castro has always believed that the CIA was behind the explosion, no suspects have ever been identified. What had my father gotten himself into? It's like his life, you know? It got tore down and just ended up in a pile of rubble. You know, I'm here in Cuba because I know something happened. And this is one of the places where it happened and, I, and I'm, I'm getting closer to finding out what it might have been. Quiero ser claro. Quiero pensar claro. Eso. 
Los hombres vienen a su casa y, y llevan una maleta. Posiblemente habían papeles, posiblemente había, no sé. Pero cuando Pero sa cuando salirán, se sí, eh, mi padre tenía... Yo veo en la mesa, en el, la oficina, el dinero. ¿eh? Dinero. Y dos, tres miles de dólares. Sí. Y me dice, a mí, hay dinero, cuando tú necesites, tú ahí, coge dinero. William Morgan siempre cuando me hablaba a mí, me hablaba, eh, no sé, de, de, de una forma que a mí no me gustaba, pero yo era igual con él. Si él me decía una cosa que a mí no me gustaba, yo le contestaba. Él decía que yo era muy fresca, que muy atrevida. Entonces, en una oportunidad... Yo veo que él le dice a Mike algo en inglés, pero yo notaba como que se dirigía a mí, porque Mike me miraba. Pero Mike se sonrió y le contestó algo. Eh, William Rojo, pero yo me callé y después yo le pregunté a Mike qué cosa era lo que William le había dicho de mí. Y él me dijo que William le había dicho que me iba a dar un gasnatón. Y él le dijo, pero sonriendo, que si él me tocaba un solo cabello, él le rompía la cara. Eso a mí nunca se me ha olvidado. about 30 miles maybe out of Havana, out in El Campo, and we are, we're looking for the, the frog farm. Uh, I read in some of my, my literature that it was out in this area. Hay, hay un lago uh, cerca de Arango, por allá. Uh -huh. Ahí está. Ahí está. El problema está que no se puede tirarle eso aquí. Oh, sí, sí. Ah. Lo, lo. ¿Entendió? Es posible que hace 39 años este lugar estaba un creadoro de, de rano toros. No. No. Hace muchos años no había rano toros. Sí, yo soy nacida aquí, pero no sé. De oh. rano toro. Estamos buscando un criadero de rana todo que hace muchos años no había por aquí. In the end, there was no frog farm to be found, but I knew it was out there, somewhere, buried under 40 years of jungle growth, and buried with it was a piece of the puzzle that connected my father to William Morgan. En una oportunidad nosotros estábamos eh, en el Guacamba y vinieron dos militares y hablaron con él, lo apartaron. Entonces después él regresó a mi casa y me dijo que él tenía que irse definitivamente. Me dijo que posiblemente él regresaba, pero bueno, no regresó más. No supe más de él mucho tiempo después. 
Mucho tiempo después supe que él me había escrito, pero mi mamá no me dio las cartas. Fue eh, una relación muy corta, pero muy bonita. La Cabana sits across the Harbor Channel from Havana, a massive Spanish fortress that became a notorious prison after Castro's victory. Under the command of Che Guevara, La Cabana was the end of the line for many who were imprisoned there. Hundreds of executions reportedly took place in this moat. William Morgan was shot against one of these walls. I could imagine the command, fuego, echoing in the moat, followed by a thunderous volley of gunfire. My father claimed to have been imprisoned in one of these cells. Doubt nagged at me. Even though I had learned a great deal in a short time, on my last day in Cuba, I still had to ask myself, where was the truth in all this intrigue? There was only one place I might find an answer to that question. But even with some inside help, I had no success at all getting any information about my father from official Cuban sources. Yo la llevé para ver el valor, el precio, pero no la cambié. Y era más valiosa que las otras que llevé. Pero no, no, nunca pensé en cambiarla. Es lo único que conservo de él. Es lo único que conservo de él. No tengo más nada. No tuve un hijo. ¿Ah? Yes. Check with immigration authorities. You may leave all your personal belongings on board. I left Havana exhausted, elated, and frustrated all at once and I came home to a long overdue message on my answering machine. Good morning, Mr. Colin. Uh, this is Johnny Davis with the Freedom of Information section at the FBI. Finally, uh, after almost four years, the FBI was going to release my father's file to me. Pertaining to your request for records uh, about your father. 580 pages. I mean, 580 pages. William Morgan's FBI file was only 380 pages. Why was my father 200 pages more interesting to the FBI? I dug into the huge file, but any hopes I had for final definitive answers about Cuba were quickly dashed. Most of the information was a heavily sanitized rehashing of things I'd already learned from Morgan's file and from Olga. But there were a few additional details about my father's time with Morgan provided by various sources. With all the sanitizing, it was impossible to make out who was who, but the description of one source in particular caught my eye. T-33 pilot, six foot four inches tall, wears fatigues. I didn't get it right away, then remembered where else I'd seen that description. Gerald Patrick Hemming. It became clear that I needed to talk to Hemming, but how do you find a spook? After a couple of months of research, more than a little serendipity, in a red-eye flight to North Carolina, I finally caught up with Hemming. I kept flashing on a passage from the book Bloody Treason, whose author, Noel Twyman, had written a huge chapter on Hemming, concluding, quote, Nowhere in the literature have I found one person with all these associations that link to the JFK assassination plot, either directly or indirectly, close quote. Depending on whose research you're looking at, Hemming was either the mastermind behind the conspiracy and one of the gunmen in Dealey Plaza, or a fall guy for the real killers. It's pretty intriguing stuff, and I had to forcefully remind myself that I was there to talk to Hemming about my father, not JFK. We're involved in very serious business. We're involved in foreign expeditions, we're involved in conspiracies, uh, you know, the kind of shit that gets you locked up or gets you killed. I, I think I ran into your father uh, casually without even, you know, who's who in a crowd of people 
that were foreign revolutionaries suspected of being uh, agents, spies, and Morgan and others got the, uh, got the impression that uh, your father was talking to the wrong people. Morgan said, this guy is asking too many questions. I've tightened up my security. The guy's been seen talking to people. He was working for the agency. Most of these people that uh, were contracting agents and, and doing things as they would do with your father for whatever purpose, to get close to Morgan or whatever the purpose was, wouldn't identify themselves as uh, working for the U.S. government. But there are a lot of contract uh, employees and other idiots out there that would. People that uh, surmised that they were working for the CIA when they didn't know who the hell they were working for. Because how do you know who you're working for? And if they've been dumb enough to tell you who they work for, then you got problems. Now, it's all done through cutouts. It's all done through people that can never be identified with the U.S. government. Later on, when your father showed up, I guess he'd been locked up for a while or something. Something happened to him. Your father was instrumental in making arrangements for an interview of Morgan by Cleet Roberts. The kind of a life you lived sounds to me like uh all of the movie scripts that were ever dreamt about in Hollywood. How does it happen that uh, you haven't uh, offered a diary for sale? Uh, it's been done, I understand, out in the West Coast. Well, uh, I happen to know the person that you were talking about. In fact, he went on television. Thank you. He went on television the other day on the West Coast and called me a the Fidel's gangster. I think was his word. Mm -hmm. Manuel Penabas, doctor. He's, uh, a man who, uh, well, let me tell you why I didn't do it, and then we'll get back to him. Uh, I don't believe that you should cash in on your ideals. Uh, I don't believe I was an idealist when I went up into the mountains, but I feel that I'm an idealist now. At least I have a, an awful strong faith in an awful lot of people, what they want to do. Uh, this other gentleman that uh, you were talking about with a diary was a fellow who went up in the mountains. I think he put it was there 30 days or 60 days, one of these things. He came down from the mountains, and the first thing he, he did was uh, to try and sell a diary for a movie. And he came out with a big publicity campaign and so forth. And as he came out with the publicity campaign, the uh, paper revolution came out and told his life story, who he was and what he was, a would-be rebel. And he came back as a lawyer, and he was going to sue the revolution. And about that time, uh, one of the heads of the revolution called him in and talked to him and said, are you trying to make money with your beard? And handed him a razor and a shaving brush. And he shaved off his, his whiskers. So since then, Mr. Penabas has been in the United States and he's cracked at uh, Fidel and he's cracked at Raul and he's cracked at the revolution. And the other day he took a very pointed crack at me and he said, this William Morgan is an American soldier of fortune. He's Fidel's gangster. Which is all right, because... Uh, Truth has an annoying habit of dying with its keepers. All the definitive answers about Cuba, about everything after. They all died with my father. So, why have I spent years of my life doing this? If I had to choose one constant, one thing I kept coming back to over the years when I would get tired or frustrated or doubt myself, it would be this a medical record of my father's from 1960. This is what the doctor had to say. Patient is essentially a bum complaining of chest pains. He was a good painter, kind of a Diego Rivera style. He liked writing. Very uh, sincere about his, his, his project. He was an inventor, that what he was. And very frank, you know, you'd like him because he was so frank and he'd come, come across with so much uh, gusto, you know. Your father was a, a Cuban revolutionary groupie, a Castro, say a Castro groupie, that later was recruited by agency cutouts. I've spent a very long time getting to know my father through the eyes of others who knew him. Whatever else he may or may not have been, 
I know that he was more than essentially a bum. Yo quería preguntarte que si cuando Mike murió, tú estabas con él. ¿Quién estaba con él? Pero tú sabes dónde él está enterrado. When Olga asked me that question, I was ashamed to admit that I didn't know where he was buried. I had never cared. I later learned that after his death, he'd been cremated, not buried. His daughters from his first marriage had arranged for a memorial plaque at the local temple. I figured it was about time for me to pay him a visit. This distance from Santa Barbara to this memorial park in San Fernando, the San Fernando Valley is something like 80 miles. In, in terms of real distance, it's the shortest distance I've had to go the entire time I've been doing this story. But emotionally, in some ways, it feels like the greatest distance. I have that, that kind of anticipation of, of not knowing. I, and I, I literally don't know. I don't know where his plaque is in this park. I don't know where the park is. I, it's, uh, it's all a great unknown. I read something when I was eight or nine about how death is always to your left, just waiting there for you, and if you turn your head fast enough, you'll see it. This was a period in my life when I missed my father a great deal, and I remember inventing a game with the exquisite illogic of the very young. It went like this. If death can be waiting on my left, maybe my father's waiting on my right, and if I turn my head fast enough, I'll see him. Some years ago, I asked my mother why I grew up without a father. Any real answers are lost in the shadows where they're likely to remain. But at the end of this journey with so many fuzzy loose ends left hanging, I accept that some truth is better than no truth. Was he crazy or sane? Was he a CIA agent or a wannabe? Did he get imprisoned and tortured as he claimed or was he just an opportunist? I don't know, I may never know, but at least I can now reach through the shadows that remain and grab hold of something true about my father. That's not a lot, but it's so much more than I had when I started this journey.